one of those, when I was uh, a slightly post-adolescent, at least chronologically, I think I didn't grow up for a lot of years after that, but somewhere around late high school or early college, I really got serious about reading the Bible. And I got so taken by one well, so many stories, of course, but, but one that just captured my heart because of its simplicity, its, it, it, it kind of became my, uh, my life, life chapter. <laughs> it's John chapter 9. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but you've got to get a, a good chunk of it to, to appreciate what's going on here. John writes, uh, beginning at verse 1, As he, that is Jesus, went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, (laughs) made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he said to him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened? They demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes and he told me to go to Siloam and wash and so I went and I washed and then I could see. Well, where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he replied. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now, the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, why? How can a sinner do such miraculous signs? And so they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And the man replied, Uh, he's a prophet? The Jews still didn't believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. (laughs) Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that he now can see? Well, we know he's our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we we don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue, excommunicated. That was why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. A second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man's a sinner. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind. But now I see. Let's pray together. Grant, Lord, that this might be one of those uh, meeting times when you make yourself evident in your word. 
And as you make yourself evident to us, give us the sense to recognize you for who you are and to give you the worship and the glory and the honor that is your due. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. So the disciples saw a man born blind and they turned to Jesus and they said, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Some people seem to think that it's their mission in life to assign blame. Occasionally they end up uh, in the life of the church. It was, after all, Jesus' disciples who asked the question, Now, granted, the common wisdom of the ancient world was that to assume that any illness uh, and suffering were the direct result of personal sin. Somebody's. But that's not how God works. He comes not to condemn, but to heal. I want you to hear how, how Eugene Peterson renders Jesus' answer to the disciples in his paraphrase of the New Testament, the message. The message. This is what Peterson says about Jesus' reply. The Lord says, you're asking the wrong question. You're looking for someone to blame. There's no such cause and effect here. Look instead for what God can do. We need to be energetically at work for the one who sent me here, working while the sun shines. When night falls, the work day's over. For as long as I'm in the world, there's plenty of light. I am the light of the world. I, I understand. I, I know the tendency to come down on the side of blame uh, rather than f- focusing my energy on, on a solution. You ever do that? Uh, it, it, I mean, it's, it's natural to want to assign blame. But it's not Jesus' way. He wants us to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. He wants this church to be one that looks for solutions and not just look to assign the blame. One person put it this way, you can either fix the blame or you can fix the problem, but you can't do both. Jesus didn't dismiss his disciples for their dullness. He corrected them. Jesus said to them, in effect, not only is this a glorious opportunity for God to deal with this man's physical blindness, it just might be an occasion to heal your spiritual blindness as well. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Well, there was one man for whom that was unquestionably true. This unnamed man in John chapter 9 had been blind from birth. For those of us us who have always been able to see, that is a darkness that that I think we we could hardly imagine. This man may have known that he was missing something in life, but he had no way of conceptualizing what it was that he was missing. I mean, how can you even describe light and the ability to see to a person who had never so much as seen a spark of light? Most of us are so accustomed to seeing and experiencing life, we, light that we, we don't even know what total darkness would be like. Researchers have discovered that when a sighted person is subjected to absolute total darkness, the brain resists that darkness and begins to throw up optical illusions of sparks and other flares of light. Once you've had the ability to see, you can't really experience the darkness of true blindness. Neurologists like Oliver Sacks have pointed out that if it really happened, that, that Jesus healed the blind in the way that they were able to immediately begin walking around and running around, then a kind of double miracle had actually occurred. Because for someone like this man who had been born blind, to simply have his optic nerves restored, that, that wouldn't be enough. 
what most of us take for granted, or at least we fail to realize, is that functioning as a sighted person is part physical, but it's part mental. In, it, you know, it's one thing to be physically able to take in visual images and sensations, but you need a huge backlog of visual experiences in your mind to know how to handle that input. So a man born blind who suddenly has his sight restored would have to learn how to see. For example, having no previous experience with depth perception, he'd probably fall down a lot because at first he'd be misjudging how far down his step, the next step was. Or he might try to lean up against a wall that was farther away than he thought it was. Newly sighted persons will sometimes reach out for something that's out of their reach, just as they might knock over things that are closer than they think they are. It even takes time to recognize common objects. They may know what a phone sounds and feels like, but they might not recognize it if you held up an, an iPhone to them and said, you know what this is? So when Jesus healed this man who was born blind, perhaps he also installed some mental software to help him use his newfound sight. That'd be a double miracle. Physically speaking, there's more than one layer to blindness. It's just as true spiritually. Some people have been in the dark all their lives, spiritually. There is a darkness that crept into the world that has blinded many people to the goodness and the beauty and the true light of God. Some people are so blind that it's, it's not enough to simply show them the light of God. They need to be told what to make of it and, and what to do with it and even what the light reveals. When a person has been blind all his life, gaining the ability to see can actually be disorienting, maybe even frightening. It's the same with spiritual blindness. Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3 that sometimes people grow so accustomed to the darkness that when the light comes, they run away. Either they're confused or they're afraid of what they'll see in the light or realize that the light is going to reveal some things that they don't want to see. The light is there for the seeing. But unless some other changes take place as well in the human heart, then just the light alone is not going to be enough. In our lesson today, Jesus healed the blind man and then he disappeared. And then in verse 12, the people asked the man about who had given him his sight. And he answered quite candidly, well, I know his name, but I, I, I really don't know. Well, it was true. I mean, he quite literally never set eyes on Jesus. Later on, after this man had been thrown out of the synagogue, Jesus found him later on in the chapter. And of course, the man didn't recognize him. He hadn't seen him before. Jesus had to show himself to, it, to the man, introduce himself to the man, before the man could at long last kneel and worship the one who had given him sight. In a number of ways, this story in which Jesus reveals himself as the light of the world, it isn't nearly as simple and straightforward as you might want, to make, want it to be. For one thing, there's this curious way that Jesus went about healing the man. I mean, he could have simply laid hands on the man and said, be healed, and he would, I'm sure he would have been healed. Jesus could do that. But oh no, Jesus had to mix his saliva with some dirt and make a mud pack, and then told the man to go to Siloam and wash it off. Huh? And then things get very complicated when the Pharisees first claimed that the healing never happened. And then they had dragged his parents into the debate, and the parents weren't any help. It really gets complicated, you know. Then, then once there was no denying the fact that the man actually had been born blind and had been healed, then the Pharisees blamed him, both for enjoying the fact that he now had sight and for refusing to say that some wayward sinner caused it to happen. This is getting really messed up. Finally, they excommunicate the man for having the audacity to get healed and then giving God the glory for having been healed. What's wrong with this picture? 
I suppose the story would be comical if it weren't such a sorry picture of the darkness into which some people can steep themselves. In the prologue to his gospel, John writes, The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. And it's true. But that sure hasn't stopped the darkness from trying to overcome it. The darkness in which Jesus' enemies were immersed was so frighteningly deep that they couldn't see the glory of the light of the world even though it was right there in front of them. And their abject blindness is a chilling reminder of just how powerful evil can be. But that kind of willful, near total spiritual blindness, that's not what most of us struggle with, is it? Most of us, I suspect, have come to the light of Christ, and we did so gladly. Our problem isn't deliberate blindness to the light of Jesus. It's, it's trying to keep that light in view when the world is throwing up so many obstacles. Sometimes life and the struggles we have to deal with are like those dear obnoxious kids of ours that get in the way when you're trying to video some event and they just keep popping up their head in front of the camera so you can't see it. Well, that's kind of, sometimes life's like that. We try to keep Jesus in focus, but the, the people and the hurts that we endure and the doubts that crop up and the tragedies that sometimes come our way, they all stick their faces in front of the camera and divert our attention away from Jesus. The light of the world. At other times, we're just confused. We see Jesus' light and we try to live by it. But, and some days, some days we feel like the formerly blind people whose eyes are working now, but we don't quite have the right depth perception. And so we fall down or we trip over things. Not so much that we're stumbling in the darkness, is it, that is, we're getting confused about what we see in the light. We're not sure that we can see very well. And so we wonder, are we missing something? We know that we're not blind the way the Pharisees were blind. But, but our spiritual eyesight often seems rather dim, doesn't it? Am I the only one here? Do all of you see the light of life perfectly all the time? All through his gospel, John plays on this light-darkness motif from the very beginning to the very end. He opens by announcing that from the very beginning, Jesus was the Word of God, and he tells us that that same creative Word of God cried out in the primordial darkness, Let there be light! Bam! What a way to start, huh? And then John tells us that this same word of God became flesh and blood and he lived among us and he was the light of humanity. And then in John chapter 3, John tells, in chapter 3, John tells us that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night wrapped in the anonymity of darkness and he was obviously drawn to that light that he saw in Jesus, but he wasn't sure he wanted to be seen in that light by other people. Later on, Jesus announced, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And in response to his claims, his enemy plotted in the shadows. They came by night, and arrested him in the garden. Then they carried out a hurried trial under the cover of darkness. And within a matter of hours, this light of the world was extinguished once and for all. Or so they thought. It's curious to me then that despite his repeated use of this imagery of light versus darkness that John is the only one of the four gospel writers who makes no mention of how dark it got on Golgotha. When Jesus was crucified, 
Matthew, Mark, Luke all talk about it got really dark. John doesn't say a word about that. It seems a little weird to me that John, who loves this light darkness motif, would just dismiss that, step right over it. Why? Well, speculation as to why someone would leave something out is, is always a little risky business. I mean, arguments from silence usually are pretty weak. Nevertheless, I can't help but wonder if John wasn't holding out for one last presentation of Jesus, the light of the world, in the midst of darkness. Fortunately for me, and it's easy to overlook, but I'm really grateful to Frederick Beekner for pointing this out. There is a marvelous scene in the last chapter of John's Gospel, right near the end. Despite the fact that they had seen the resurrected Lord, the disciples evidently were, they didn't know what to do next. Uh, and so what did they do? They reverted to type. They, they, they went back to what was familiar. They all went fishing. Hopped in the boat, out in the Sea of Galilee, fishing, and it was night. <laughs> and of course, they came up empty-handed. And by then, I suspect they were wondering if they were good for anything. They certainly couldn't fish anymore. As it was nearing the end of that long night, a lone figure called out to them from the shore. Couldn't make out who it was shrouded in the darkness and the mist. But when he told them to try fishing on the other side of the boat, and they landed a net full of fish, it didn't take them long to figure out who it was. When they reached the shore, they found Jesus, the light of the world, tending a charcoal fire. There was some fish already cooking, and there was bread. But that wasn't the main item on the menu today. A generous helping of forgiveness was served up as Jesus reinstated Peter despite his denials in the night just a few days before. There in the still morning air, the resurrected light of the world lit a small fire. Beekner says that John opens with the light of creation, a light almost too extraordinary to take in. And John ends with a flicker of a fire on a beach, a light almost too ordinary to take seriously. And nestled between the two, in the middle of the gospel, Jesus declares himself once more to be the great I am, claiming to be not only the light of creation, but the light of salvation. In the dark, chill morning air, the light of the world bent over a pile of sticks and charcoal. He cupped his hands around the little spark and blew on it to get the fire going. And in the glow of that fire, Jesus did what he came and died and rose again to do. To offer forgiveness, to restore the sight of one who had lost his way. And so he gently blew on the embers of Peter's faint faith in a way that would ensure that the flame of Pentecost would soon blaze in Peter's heart. Jesus is the light of the world. And there will probably be seasons in your life when you feel like you're 
basking in the sunshine of God's love. And when those times happen, in as much as you can see your way to keep putting one foot ahead of the other, remember to be grateful for those bright days. But there will doubtless be other times, times when the light grows dim. The way may not seem nearly so clear or easy to follow for you. But John's gospel reminds us that Jesus is still the light of the world. And that light will go on glowing as Jesus cups his hands around our fragile hearts and gently blows. What flares up may not appear as stunning as creation's first light. May not throw heat like a solar furnace hung in space. But it will be light and it will be warm and it will be of Jesus and he will never let it go out. When you know Jesus, the light of the world, you don't ever have to walk in darkness. The life of faith won't always be bright like the sunshine of a fine afternoon in spring, but the light of the world will always be there, glowing with forgiveness and hope, and speaking as one who has tried to walk in his light for quite a number of years now. It is quite enough for me to sit with Jesus around a fire, to share his provision, and always a warm helping of grace. I say that because like the man born blind, I too take the words quite seriously and personally when I'm invited to sing I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Yeah. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord. Thank you for catching us by surprise in those ordinary moments. But right now, God, thank you that you're there in those moments when we don't see you. And you'll never leave us, never forsake us. We can carry on until that day. God, let it be soon, if you will, until that day when we get to see you in the light of day and to know you even as we are known. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.